And this is probably a good reason why this man has never lost in his NFL coaching experience. Hey, Sully, I don't want to get conservative, man. They've been pounding that run. Rhythm pass, play to win. Ah, oh, damn it, GP. Just get ready to make another damn play. Get us out of here. <laughs> Talk to two. We ain't gonna, hey, we ain't gonna get conservative and scared. Rhythm pass, play to win. At the two-minute warning, wants to throw it. And he does, and Pickens has it. First down, 30, throwing the ball. Where you probably put $150,000 that they'd run it. <laughs> hey, no, routinely. Hey, I can't believe he threw the ball there. That, that <laughs> Bill on the, Hillgrove. Bill Hillgrove on the call. Been a Pittsburgh voice for a long, long time. Uh, why do you think the Steelers team has had such a big change? And what does that clip tell you about how Tomlin's viewing maybe this offense versus other offenses in the past for him? Well, let's start with Tomlin. I think he's watching the game, right? So he sees Seattle. He knows that they potentially could get back in the game. He's managing the game not based on a chart, not based on analytics, based on what he sees, which I think is really important. You got to watch the game. You got to understand the flow of the game. He got it, you know, and he knew that his offense could win that game. And I think that's something that we miss at times, especially in the light of, you know, where Dan Campbell decides on, you know, to go for a field goal. He's got six more possessions to go. He loses the game by one point. I know that all the controversy around the call, but yeah, everybody loves the aggressiveness, but you had six more possessions. Take the points. Last time I checked football, we keep score and we play the game how it's going, not how we think it should on a sheet. And I think the fact is, look, the reason they're winning is because they're making plays in a passing game. They're throwing the ball up the field. Rudolph has given them some hope. They, they've had these receivers, but they're able to make explosive plays. You can't go in the NFL three yards, three yards, five yards, six yards, ten. You got to make an explosive play. This just goes right back to Michael Penix. I mean, this is what makes him such an attractive candidate because, you know, he could he might be 20 for 40 in completions, but he's going to make 20 big-time throws. We get so caught up, well, he's a 70% completion thrower. What does that mean if they're throwing for five yards a pass, right? You know, look at Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy's averaging almost 10 yards per attempt. That's what you have to have to win in the National Football League. When you're at that 7-0 category, you're not beating any team like that, not on a consistent basis. And I think that's really what, what Tomlin saw in that game. He knew it. The modern NFL has so many more explosives than old school NFL used to have. They used to say, we need to take at least one shot a quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, one shot a quarter. And then it, some people wouldn't even do that. <laughs> now it's like, you got to open it up. Because if you open it up, then it lightens the box a little bit. Now everything else that we got running RPO-wise and option-wise and kind of drag routes behind the linebacks, that's all happening. So it's like, now they're more efficient than ever, but the deep ball is just a common thing. Just like trick plays are kind of. Go I think go. I think Tomlin's just so much more confident and maybe trust Mason more than the quarterbacks they had the rest of the year. Who's that? Uh, Mitch, for one, for sure, and also Kenny. Um, Maserati? Because, I mean, you were there, uh, Colts game. Uh, I believe Tomlin down, I think it was, they were down seven, and they punted from the plus 38 on a, on a fourth and short. F first drive of the game against the Seahawks, fourth and five, he went for it. This one, he throws for it with two minutes left. I think he's just much more confident in the quarterback position. I wonder how much more say he has in the offense first whenever Canada was there, maybe. You know, because whenever you move on, especially how long was Canada there? Three years? Yes. Three years. So there's, like, habits that build – over those three years and maybe schedule and conversations and how it goes week in, week out. So whenever you get a new offense coordinator, I wonder how much more Tomlin is involved with them, potentially. Uh, uh, go ahead. Lomba. I, I think he's always been involved in the big picture, managing the day-to-day, -day, what's going on in the game, how are we going to win this game specifically. And I think that's what he does a tremendous job of. How do we have to play it? It might be ugly. We might have to run it. i got to manage Mitch Trubisky. Look, we don't have to look any further than Joe Flacco. Right, Deshaun Watson, when he was playing, averaged 28.5 passes per game. Flacco comes off the couch, off the couch, and Stefanski's calling 42 and a half passes a game, and they haven't really been behind other than the Ram game. And that was a close game going in the fourth quarter. So the point is, is Stefanski saying, I can throw the ball. Now, we understand Flacco turns it over at, at a higher rate, 
But Flacco makes explosive plays, and all of a sudden the Browns' offense looks way different because he can complete passes on the third level. This is something that you can't ignore. This is what makes Penix really an attractive candidate because he can complete those. Now, I'm not saying he can't complete the underneath stuff either. We get it. But when you can, when you have a, when you have a guy that can throw it up the field, over routes, you know, inside deep cuts. You know, all of a sudden, chunk plays. I mean, nothing drives me crazier, Pat, than a start a two minute drive and you throw the check down. Like, you're better off with an incompletion than you are with a check down. You need yards. Yeah, like this throw. I mean, mm. could you have just walked it out there any better? <laughs> and it's a soft throw. It's Catch a soft ball. throw. It, yeah, like Boomer Esiason, when he played in Cincinnati, Works he up. had a lot of these similar skills. But Boomer threw a hard ball. Now, Boomer would Boomer would cut the receiver's fingers because his ball was <laughs> tough. I mean, he, he was throwing fastballs. This kid, this ball's soft. It lands perfectly. Yeah, he, he throws a beautiful ball. He's mature. He's played a lot of football, yes. which is another thing that mm -hmm. a lot of people think yeah. about whenever they're going into the NFL. Excited to see him. You brought up Flacco there. He's been so much fun to watch. And yeah. he also says water. I don't know if you know that. He's a water speaker. So I'm I, a water guy, too. Yeah, yeah. that's what he I was about to from say. from the jersey. It's, mm -hmm. all, it's, it's, it's all part of our dialogue. I think he's comeback player of the year. I said it after, I said it after the – and anybody listen to the pod – I said it after the, the Rams game. I mean, this guy's coming back from 2018. Look, I mean, DeMar Hamlin, you know, uh, understanding that. I'm very proud of him. Yeah. Way to go, DeMar. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I DeMar. get that. Love I mean, DeMar. you come back from death, you deserve an award. I don't care. <laughs> I, I get that, yep, right? Yeah, we all agree. But Flacco's coming back from 2018. And, and the other guy on this list that I don't think gets <laughs> enough love. I, I, I don't think he gets enough yeah. yeah. This guy, comeback yeah. player of the year, he, he traveled in time. I mean, we've had two fashion changes since Flacco played good. You know, I mean, things have been in and out of style since he played well. I'll tell you, the other guy is Stafford. Like, this guy's playing at a high – I know Martindale mentioned that he should be in the MVP. I think the guy, since he's come back off the injury – unbelievable mm -hmm. the way he's been able to play. And when they have that running game going, man, they're tough. Yeah, the Rams are tough. A lot of teams are peaking right now, including those two guys' teams coming into uh, the playoff run. Last question for me before the boys have it there. Uh, there's, there's no playoff run for this team, but there is a lot of awesome stuff happening. Yep. David Tepper is awesome. We need yeah. a microphone on him. We need a camera on him. <laughs> what? And we know the story, obviously, <laughs> of him buying somebody that he didn't like in the past who is one of the people above yeah. him at the company. Then he obviously goes and makes his own money, buys this guy, never give him a raise or a promotion, buys this guy's house, tears it down completely, mm -hmm. builds a bigger, badder, better house. We know that he's maybe a little petty. We know that he maybe has a little bit of spike. We know that he likes to say things and tell people how to do their jobs, even though he hired them to do their jobs. He's fired like four soccer coaches down there yep. in Charlotte FC. He's fired, if you count the interim coaches and not retaining them, letting them go, like five coaches in the Carolina Panthers in like a matter of like six, seven years now. Yep. Oh, yeah. this, is, uh, this is a guy who he wants it all when? Now. Mm -hmm. He also doesn't want to hear any of these fans shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Down in Jacksonville, somebody was chirping him all mm -hmm. game. Bye. And on his way out, he said, you know what? How about this? Who? Ice. Backwash. I'm out of here. I'm going to go get on a helicopter, and I'm going to fly out of this godforsaken town, yeah. is what he said pretty much. He gets slapped with a $300,000 fine, and then a message says that, you know, every executive in the NFL is expected to act with a, le a level of class and respect and all of that, obviously. We see that, we laugh, we think to ourselves, it's a shame that fan that got hit with that ice ended up with a broken neck, yep. broken yep. back, broken exactly. legs, and we hope Tepper will make it right with them, obviously. Hundreds of millions of dollars in lost earnings, uh, potential in the future for the ice in the eye, yep. yeah. for that one person that was going to be a professional sniper. <laughs> right. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's right. a lot of things that happen there. These are, not, these are jokes, by the way. Jeez. Just kidding. Just Sorry. kidding. We're just joking. Just kidding, Tepper. But when you see that, and then you see the history of him firing head coaches. Who's going to go – like, it's just going to have to be the big paycheck, that's why, or somebody that's not going to have a lot of head coaching options. Like, who wants to go work for that? If that's what's happening publicly after they lose, and then we hear about these Monday – what's happening – who's going to want to go work for that guy, Lombo? How, how do you think I mean, that all thing pans out? Oh, I think it's a fair question. I'm sure the league office is having conversations with them about that as well. Look, I, I think he's frustrated. I think he talks to way too many people. One of the things I think he needs to do is lose his cell phone. He, he's one of these classic owners that calls people in the media, calls. He's looking for all this advice, and at the end of the day, really, he's looking for somebody to reaffirm what he thinks. 
and he needs somebody to shoot shoot him straight. Like he needs somebody to look him in the eye and say, "Look, you built this billion dollar hedge fund. You got homes all over the world. You you did it because you had a plan, you had a system in place, you had a process, and you thought and made decisions correctly. You're acting as if it's going to happen overnight. I mean, you're out there digging up the crop before the roots even settle down." You, you got to get somebody who's got enough guts to stand in front of them and say, hey, David, I know you made billions over here, but the only way you're going to win in this league with 31 competitive people is by having a plan, by having a system in place, by building a team that is to your – you can't skip any steps here. There's no – there's no. you know, Belichick used to tell the team all the time, you know, there's no magic pill we're going to take to lose 20 pounds. Like, you got to put the work in. Well, you're going to have to Bill, put the work Bill, in. Bill, there is you, something. You know? It's so, a, and, you know, they're, they're, so I think to me, that's what he needs. I think he needs somebody who's got enough guts to look him in the eye and say, hey, David, you want to either do this right and use your money to a resource or you want to continue to be compared to Dan Snyder. You decide. Some of those guys and girls at that level there, they want an alpha to come in, you know, and be like, I ain't taking your shit. Like, that is how this is going to go. And that could potentially be what he's been waiting for mm -hmm. in the NFL. You know, like, I don't know if Frank Reich ever gave him the impression that Frank yeah. Reich was going to go in there and tell him, you need to stop telling me what to do. Matt Rule, maybe, though, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, Matt Rule, first time in the NFL, yeah. though, Bingo. it's like, is he, you know, so if he gets a Harbaugh, if he's able to pay enough, and Harbaugh I don't think would be ever scared to say, yeah, this ain't how this goes, yes, both privately and publicly, mm -hmm. because he's been there, he's done that before. Sean Payton, you know, he was like that, I guess, with Denver, mm -hmm. where he came in. He was very public about it. He needs somebody like that, right? That, that is yeah. somebody he needs? Yeah, you do. And But, uh, you know, Sean Payton interviewed in Carolina. That wasn't what he wanted. You know, Sean didn't even come back for a second interview. So you you got to have mm -hmm. the climate has to be right. I mean, David's at the point now where he's got to buy credibility. I mean, he's got a stadium situation that's not right. He's got a, a practice facility he was going to build in South Carolina that didn't work out. I mean, his credibility with his own fan base is dwindling. And his behavior is causing this. And he's too smart of a human being. You don't make billions of dollars in one area that's and all of a sudden become stupid in another. But what he's doing wow. is he's trying to rush it. He has no plan. And I, and I think ultimately, you know, you can, he can learn from Eddie DeBarlow, who was an emotional owner who you know if, when we lost it was hard but he also took a step back and he gave bill walsh the authority to run his team and said okay i tried it the other way it doesn't work i'm going to do it this way now he's in the hall of fame and with all his super bowl rings and so i think there's past performance for tepper should predict future achievement and he needs to study that like he needs somebody to say that hey david you're going to do this you, you know this is the dumbest thing we could possibly ever do like, and if you do it, David, you know, you're going to be in trouble. Drink. But you got to have somebody who has guts to do it, right? You and know, accomplished. Like, you got to have somebody that's accomplished, too. That's not going to be a type of confidence that's coming from somebody that hasn't accomplished anything as a head coach, though, too, I think. No, that's why if he hires a young assistant coach who's never been a head coach before, Steamroll. it's going to be impossible. It's going to yeah. be hard. Yeah. You know, it's going to be all of a sudden he's going to be on the phone. I mean, he's going to be on the phone talking to this person, talking to that person. Like, they need to cut off all cell service in that area. Maybe they just need to throw some water on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, moving ahead with more topics, D-Bud has a question for you, Lombo. Hey, Lombo, I'm going to put you in the chair. You are the GM. I'm sure this will be, you know, obviously the conversation of the NFL going into April with the Chicago Bears sitting there with that number one pick. Um, but what, where are you at with Justin Fields and what he's – I know he's had a really good season. Obviously, you got Joe Alt there in the draft. You got some great oh, receivers as well at the top of that draft. Do you go and get a quarterback and flip it, reset that quarterback market, or do you stick with Justin Fields, build around him? What, what are you doing in that in that chair? Hey, he's Lombard. number one hey, Justin Fields hater, by the way. Yeah. Sweet Shaq, No, that's not way. true. I was trying to temper some people who were trying to give him oh, the MVP. Oh, okay. got to be good. Okay. Be great. Smart, smart. Early, can the kid get good before he gets great? Do we have to give him the MVP in, in, in August? I mean, seriously. And look, I, I think he has trouble throwing the football on a consistent oh, basis. But let me answer the question. All right. To me, this the, the question's getting framed the wrong way. The question should be framed, are we going to pay Justin Fields 40 to $50 million per year on a four-year deal? Is that what you plan to do? Are we valuing him there? If the Bears feel that's the right answer, then they're going to make other picks. If the Bears say you can't do that, that'll mess up our cap. It'll, it'll really hurt us in trying to manage and build the team around them. 
then they've got to go to fields and say, look, here's our deal. Here's where we can go. We'll keep you at this number. We're not going to pay you that number. If he doesn't want that, then you hold on to him. You make your draft. You select a quarterback. And you listen to people out there. You know, And you don't have to jump on the first deal. You can bring fields back, rest the number one pick in the draft, let him develop, play fields for another year, and when the time's right, make the move. Like No one has to rush you into a decision. You know, No one has to pressure you. But the real question is, the real question that Bears fans don't want to answer is, are you paying him 40 to 50 million? Daniel Jones got 40 million, right? Th- this market for quarterbacks, it isn't that, you know, where are we going to find one? Is are we going to pay the second contract? No one's asking that question. Are you paying the second contract for Mac Jones? No, that's easy. Are you paying the second contract for, you know, Trey Lance? No, that's easy. Are you paying it for Trevor Lawrence? There becomes a problem. Are we? Got no choice. We have to. Okay. Is it the right thing to do? Right? You get into that, we have no choice. That's where the Giants were. We have no choice. We have to pay Daniel. When you have no choice, you really make a bad decision. So you, with this opportunity that the Bears have, it really sets them up where if they're smart and they're deliberate, they can make a great decision. So I, you also can add in there, and you said the Giants felt like they had no options. No choice. Everybody had Joe Flacco sitting at home. And then you think about what happened yeah. with Tom Brady – and what has happened mm-hmm. with other, like, fourth contracts? Or do we want to maybe go find, like, a fourth contract player who still got it a little bit, who might only cost, what, $20 million? Mm-hmm. $20 yeah. million? Right. If they do what? Like, Flacco, probably what, next year? He's going to sign a two-year deal, probably forty to $45 million? I, I don't know, because Flacco, if you study Flacco's career, he's really good in that Stefanski. Really, it's Gary Kubiak's system. God, you know, God bless Gary Kubiak. It's his system. And he was really good in that when the Ravens played with him in 14. Flacco was very good. But then when he lost that, he lost that ability. Like, I don't know how the Browns don't bring Flacco back. I know they got Deshaun at $65 million for the oh. next three years, but he's the best player for their offense right now. I think he'll get, you know, and Flacco knows that, right? Flacco knows this is the best way for me to make money. Like, I can get how many somewhere other, else in my how many career. Other, how many other ones are those around here? That's, like, the next question, then. How many other locations Like, are who there? would fit that scheme? I, I mean, I think, to me, well, you know, we know that – we know Shanahan runs that scheme. It's it's the Kubiak, Mike Shanahan. We know that Houston runs that scheme. But they run it, and they understand it. It's one thing to steal the plays. It's another thing to understand the scheme, right? That everybody steals the plays. Everybody stole Kubiak's, you know, throwback to the tight end on the over route. That's become so popular, or the delay route. But it's do you understand the offense? And I think that, and how you coach the quarterback too. Let's not minimize that. It's how the relationship is between the coach and the quarterback. 